every uh, one, but those both are close to home for us, right? And uh, folks that we know and, and love and want to see those works go forward. So, so praise the Lord for that. They do, as I said, have tonight. I don't know there. It's getting close to late, but, um, but maybe pray for tomorrow as well that needs will be met there as well as the word of God go forth. So I think that's all. One, there's one last, anybody got any, any other prayer requests or praise tonight? All right. Uh, grab your Bibles if you would. We'll come back to these. And I want you to open your Bible to the book of Psalms in chapter 78. Psalms chapter 78. And uh, when you find your place, if you would stand with me. I'm not going to read the entire psalm uh, tonight, but we're going to read about 39 verses of it. That's what we'll cover, and just kind of for the sake of time, that's what we'll read. The Bible says this, Give ear, give ear, O my people, to my law. <clears throat> Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their uh, children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, to the generation that to come might know, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. It might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand up as an heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all night with the light, a light of fire. He cleaved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths, he brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they skinned, uh, sinned pardon me, yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven. Uh, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp round about their habitations. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust. But while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity, and their years in trouble. When he slew them, they sought him. When they returned and inquired, and they returned and inquired, inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and made and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. They lied unto him with their tongue, for their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he... All this time and even this is someone giving testimony to what God had done. This wasn't God saying, I did this. This was a man who observed it saying, God did this. And then he gives this testimony. 
But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time again tonight. Just pray you'd bless us time in your word and that you'd challenge us, Lord. Um, certainly you've challenged my heart uh, today. And I pray that you would challenge us all tonight. We'd be drawn closer to you. We would be more determined, Lord, to walk as Christ and to follow you and to learn from you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing tonight and please be seated. So I want to make a statement to you and it's really very simple, that we are instructed by God to be a merciful people. How many of you are familiar with Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7? Anybody? Here's how it starts out. Blessed are the merciful. It's in the Beatitudes. And God is saying, listen, it's an expectation that mercy would be a part of the character of a reborn believer. Those Beatitudes are describing the traits of those who are born again and pursuing being transformed into the image of Christ so that he might use them to affect the, the world with the gospel of Christ. And so in Matthew 5, he says, look, it's necessary that a part of your character, if you're going to be able to truly uh, uh, live a life which brings honor to me, is mercy. Okay? Now, uh, you say, preacher, uh, why that? Well, because our God is merciful, okay? We all enjoy the mercy of God, but let me remind you, just one uh, set of verses out of the book of Numbers. You don't have to turn there, I have them, but Numbers 14 says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So we have this very clear instruction. God is merciful, and God has called upon uh, his people to be uh, people of mercy. We're to be merciful uh, people and have mercy. Someone tell me what mercy is. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but I want to get the Sunday school answer right now. Someone tell me what mercy is. Okay. I'll go along with that. Anybody want to add to it? So, simplest terms, pardon me, simplest terms, it's not giving you what you deserve, right? So we deserved judgment from God, didn't we? I mean, we can not like that, but it's just true. And he had the ability to give that judgment, just like David said. But God withheld that judgment out of mercy. And that mercy really made place for I, what I call mercy's cousin, grace. That instead of giving us what we deserved, he gave us what we did not deserve, the unmerited favor of God. So God is merciful and he deals with us in mercy. And, um, and he calls upon us to be merciful. And I would even say when we look at it in Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes there, I would describe it this way, that really mercy is a part of the bait of our life. Matthew chapter 5 is describing these character traits in the Beatitude that are necessary in Christians' lives so that we can be deployed into the world and that people would, by our life and through our words, come to know Christ as a Savior. Our words are hollow if our life is not bait. Okay? We're fishers of men. That's why I say bait. And uh, something has to get them to look at the worm, the hook, before they take the hook. What gets them to look is our life. It doesn't redeem them. It's the words of truth that they believe and trust in, that they find redemption in. But part of the great teaching of the Beatitudes is, look, I'm getting ready to, uh, to go. He hasn't told them that yet, but that's what he knows. And I'm going to prepare you uh, because of the multitude that's out there. Jesus saw the multitude. <clears throat> Pardon me. He saw the multitude and he sat down and taught his disciples, blessed are and gave those beatitudes. 
those traits that are necessary, character traits, for them to be able to have the impact on the multitudes uh, that he is having uh, when he leaves. It's part of the bait of our life. One of those beatitudes, Matthew 5, 7, is a beatitude of mercy. And, and really, it's quite simple. It's a necessary trait, and it's a part of the bait of our life, and it is to be who we are. If both of those things are true, and they are, if it's a part of what he says are the necessary character traits, and it really is a part of how we become able to reach people, okay? Do you know that when you and I don't live these character traits in the Beatitudes, our words of kindness fall pretty, pretty hollow on people's ears, don't they? I used to work with a guy in the army named Tony. He's a staff sergeant, he's a, a good guy, he was a professing believer, and I believe he was. Um, he, uh, he was of a, a slightly different, by a mile, um, type of uh, perhaps uh, activity than we would undergo. But he'd always run around and say, oh, praise Jesus, oh, praise Jesus, oh, praise Jesus. And uh, I'm fine with that. The problem was is what he said when he wasn't saying praise Jesus. He might have said Jesus, but not praise Jesus. Or things like that. And so pretty soon it became kind of the joke in the unit. Like, yeah, okay, Tony's here, praise Jesus, you know. Because what happened is his life didn't become the gospel. This character traits. And one of them is mercy. That it's, it's not controvertible tonight. It's not controversial even. That we're to be merciful towards others. It's what God says. And so uh, this psalm really talks a lot about mercy, though it doesn't use the word mercy often. And I'd like to begin uh, considering it with you tonight and, and maybe just to get us to measure our lives. But, but I, I want to uh, you know, start here. When, when is mercy most needed? See, God is described as being long-suffering, really uh, an attribute of mercy uh, at the uh, end of the text that we read. But he, there's a lot of things that go on before this. And I think that it's important that we look at when mercy is most given. So notice the first seven verses. This won't take very long tonight. We're not going to try to, uh, to uh, in-depth uh, walk through every verse. But in the first seven verses, he talks about the task or, or tells them, reminds them of the task that they had been given by God. And the task ultimately was, <clears throat> man, the task ultimately was to, uh, to take the things that they had been given and make sure that the next generation received them as they were. That was their task. They were to, to hand it off so that, as we read uh, in verse number 7, that they, the next generation, might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandment. So, listen, <clears throat> I'm telling you that this was such a simple task to simply pass on to the next generation their knowledge and relationship with God that they were given. But what we know is, is that they didn't really do that. They had a simple task, but they really didn't do that. In fact, they lived such lives uh, in, in front of them that it really erased in the minds of the next generation all of the wonderful works of God. So just get this. They needed mercy when they had a task to do that was simple, clearly given by God, and yet they really fell short of it. Uh, the second thing we see is that the life they had to show their next generation was a great life because of their relationship with God. And the next several verses, we're not going to read them all again, but the next several verses talk about what God did because of the relationship that they had with him. And uh, we'll just uh, look at a little bit of it. Uh, they had been delivered from bondage in great power you realize that they could not have gotten out of Egypt without the miraculous, powerful intervention of God. And they did all of that. I mean, God, uh, it's, it's put down here. They, uh, they, uh, they, he carried them out. They didn't obey. They turned back in battle. They didn't keep the covenant, verse 10. Uh, marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in, in uh, Egypt, and in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. We know all of these stories. We know these events that took place. 
He led them in the daytime and the nighttime by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He gave them, uh, he gave them water out of the rocks of the wilderness uh, as of the great depths. He brought streams of, out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. Verse 17, I draw your attention to that. He did all of these wonderful things. They had this great life. Because of their relationship with God. Because they were in a covenant relationship with God. But verse 17 says, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the most high God in the wilderness. They'd been delivered. They'd been delivered by God's power. God had done something in their life that never could have happened except God did it. No one else really uh, would or could do. God both would and could and did uh, do these things in their life. And yet they sinned more against God, verse 17. And they murmured against God, right? They, uh, uh, verse uh, uh, 17, they provoked him in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. And they said, can God finish, uh, furnish a tur tur table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the wa rock and waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Uh, can he provide flesh for his people? 21, therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel. So here they are, uh, they've not taken care of their simple task and they had a, a life that they really didn't deserve. Isn't that right? Uh, they uh, really wouldn't obey the covenant. They didn't give God the glory for what uh, he did in their life. They'd been delivered in power. But the Bible says they just sinned more and more. And we read this, that God was not happy with them. The Lord heard this, verse 21, and was wroth because they believed not in God, verse 22, and, uh, and, uh, and trusted not in his salvation. So here they are. They had a great life that they had been delivered in power. And not only that, but in this great life, they had been bountifully provided for and were unthankful for that. Look in verse 23, we left off reading there. It says, uh, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors from heaven and rained down manna upon them to eat and given them the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food, he sent them uh, meat to the full. Uh, verse 26 begins to talk about the wind blowing in 27 and, and, the, and the birds that were brought into the camp, right? Uh, and they landed right there. I mean, verse 28 is not an accident. The, the birds didn't fly and land five miles away. They landed in the midst of their habitations round about them and they ate verse 29 and were well filled for he gave them their own desire they were not estranged from their lust but while the meat was yet in their mouth the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel for for all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works so here you got these people who had been given a clear task, clear commandments. They were in a covenant with God. S really simple, I say that. I, I understand the challenges, but the work of God really at its core is not all that difficult uh, to, to execute. And, and they, um, they just provoked God to anger, didn't do it. And, and they were living this great life uh, where they had been delivered from bondage with great power, where they had been prov bountifully provided for, and they were unthankful. And we read in verse 21 and 22 that God is wroth against them, not happy about that. In verse 31 that he was angry, and yet they keep on sinning, verse 32. So, listen, when the simple commands of God, listen to this closely, and the bountiful provision of God are refused and ignored, Anyone in that position is in need of mercy. And if I su could suggest to you that really there's lots of things in our life perhaps that we could do to need mercy from God, but they would all boil down to this. Ignoring the simple commands, refusing to give him what he deserves for his bountiful provision, and just sort of living the good life without ever acknowledging God or obeying God at all. They needed mercy. And when I ask you the question, when do you need mercy? It's when you find yourself having deliberately stepped outside of the commandments of God or the boundaries and having ignored God's goodness in your life, knowing that what we read here is that those things stir the wrath of God. They provoke God to anger. Now, look, God is not a, uh, is not a God who is hot-headed. OK, uh, these events that we talk about went on over generations of people. 
Okay? And what they were passing on to each successive generation was less obedience to God and more ignoring of his bountiful provision and goodness in, his, in their lives. And so it just grew worse and worse. But please get this. When the simple things are not done and the things that are done that are undeserved are ignored and not graceful for, we're in deep need of mercy. But I, I would say this, that it's not just you and I as a people being in need of mercy, but there are often people who are in need of mercy from us. And uh, there are people who need uh, mercy uh, from us when, when we, they find themselves even in this condition. Let me try to explain. How many of you get tired of the foolishness that you see going on in our culture today? How many of you remember 2020? Dun, dun, dun. And how many of you remember the riots that I don't think they've ever gotten over in Seattle? And uh, the lawlessness, the, all of that stuff. We were up here actually during part of that time and in Seattle during part of that time. And one day, uh, Brother Ferris and I decided that we were going to go down to the Chaz Zone. I'm sure he told you about it. I don't know if his perspective is the same as mine, but we took a pack of church tracks or two and, and we went down there and we tried to have conversations with people. That in itself was a challenge. Um, trying to engage them in a conversation and lead them to a point where you could really talk about the truth. Um, it's, I, it's simple apologetics. Most evangelism is really apologetics, but, but it's just simply meeting them where they're at and trying to lead them through truth to where you can really engage them with, with truth directly. And it just uh, it never failed. We certainly left some tracks behind and we had some conversations. Some of them were comical looking back on it, you know. They did tell us, they had a platform and they had these community meetings every day and I said, what would it take for me to get up there and talk to the crowd? And they said, oh, you just got to talk to that lady. They identified her to us. But she was um, uh, one of the uh, leaders of a group of people there that was very much against what we believe in. And a day or two before we went there, a guy that had gone in trying to do what we were doing might have been a little bit uh, unwise in the way he did it, but he sort of got beat down in that place. And... Um, you know, I was fairly determined that I didn't want that to be the outcome that day. So, uh, but, but, you know, she wouldn't have anything to do with us standing up. And I know what would have happened if we had. Um, it wouldn't have been received. I don't have any reason to believe it would have been. But we still went and did that. Now, there were some other men that I invited to go with us. And really to a, to a man they said, why would I want to go there? Those people are, they're, you're not going to make any headway with them. I'm reminded, though, of a verse in the Bible that says that, you know, that we plant and we water and God gives the increase. Amen. And our planting and watering, particularly in cases like that, but in every case, is really our recognizing their need of mercy and being the avenue of God's mercy into their life. Do you understand this? And yes, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, some of the conversations that we had uh, down there, they make your head spin around. You think this, how could you? Uh, okay. Um, I mean, they make no logical sense. But they're not supposed to make logical sense. These are lost people who are stoked by an agenda and drugs. And if ever there was a collective group of people together that needed somebody that would go in there, and have a reasonable conversation with an effort to introduce them to God's mercy, it's those people. Yeah. What they didn't need to be was standing in the need of mercy and ignored by those who could help them find it. We need to be merciful. Amen. That's us being merciful. Being merciful is not just being nice when your neighbor scratches your car. That's probably staying within the legal boundaries because of what you want to do. It's not merciful, by the way, what you want to do. <laughs> Being merciful is really seeing their need of God's mercy, isn't it? 
and being a part of that. That's why this is such an important part of the bait of our life, of the, of the attributes that we find in the, in the Beatitudes, because it's, he's getting ready to try to deploy them. And says, look, you're going to have to recognize that they may be, how do I say this, they may be unreasonable, unruly, obtuse, uh, downright mean. Uh, they may reject you and spit upon you and revile you and hate you. They've done all of those things to me, but they need my mercy. And I'm sending you to show them every time. See, we're called upon to be people of mercy. That doesn't just mean be nice people when people are mean people. It means recognize the depth of the mercy that they need and give ourselves to God to be used to try to bring them to his mercy. Merciful. Not treating them like they deserve to be treated. Frankly, I think bulldozing the place down would have been a legitimate political response at some level. But it wasn't a legitimate response of God's mercy. Because God didn't put them in our area so that we could throw stuff at them. He put them so that we could plant in water the seeds of God's mercy. And we still have that, don't we? We have a lot of inconvenience going on around us in the world today. Or even if I would say it this way, we have a lot of ickiness going on, don't we? I mean, there's just some things that you look at and you go, if your mother knew that, would she? If my mother knew that about me, I know what would happen. She'd be like, I'm not too old. Don't make me tell a story. <laughs> no, she revealed herself. <laughs> so, so just get this. We'll move on and be done in a minute. We're called to be people of mercy. But this is what mercy is. How do we become, how do we become those people? How do we become people of mercy so that God can use us to bring people in desperate need of mercy into his mercy. Real quickly, in the, in the 78th Psalm, once again, just, a, just about five more verses. Look at verse 34 with me. It says this, uh, When he slew them, then they sought him. They returned and inquired early after God. I want to read verse 33. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, they sought him. And they returned uh, and inquired early after God. So I want to tell you this, first of all. Mercy is not simply forgetting others' failures, okay? That's not what mercy is. We often, uh, this is often, I think, uh, sort of the, I, I don't know, passive-aggressive way that we deal with people. Instead of standing up and being an, able to be an instrument of mercy without condoning, we just try to be like, ah, don't make eye contact. You know, if we don't make eye contact, they won't, they won't bother us and we won't bother them. Let's just kind of pretend like, you know, that, that doesn't exist. And let's just let it be and it'll all be okay. It's not true and that's not what mercy is. In fact, that's the opposite of mercy. That's, that's aggressive harm to them. When I have the ability to try to bring them to God's mercy and I refuse to because of their ickiness, that's not mercy. And I might value myself to be kind and generous and an upstanding person by going like, oh, let's just, I mean, can't we all just get along? Well, no, no, not necessarily. There are things that have to be dealt with. That's not mercy. And God didn't do that with Israel. He didn't just say like, oh, well, you know, I mean, I'll just overlook it this time. No, 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 he, he, he slew them. Their days were consumed in vanity. He dealt with them according to justice, his justice. And we don't execute his justice. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. But please know this, turning your head and looking the other way and pretending like we're all just the same when we know there's a desperate need of mercy, that's not mercy. And that's not what God did. Let me tell you what else mercy is not. Verse 35 says, And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues. 
So, listen, it's not mercy, or mercy is not just confined to those who, uh, who act like they're trying to do right, but uh, really don't do right, or, you know, sort of the feigned innocent and the feigned simple. They forgot about God. I mean, I have to be honest with you, I don't believe what that says. I believe it's true that it was said. I believe that that's what they did, but, uh, or said they did, but I don't believe they forgot about God. These are people who lived every day in a covenant relationship with God who had the presence of God manifest constantly in their life. No, no, no. They were acting like they were innocent, and they were acting like they were in- ignorant, but they really weren't. And, and yet, oftentimes, it's those that we might say, well, let's be merciful to them. They flattered and lied to God. And, and mercy is not simply being nice to those who are trying to do nice. Verse 37 says this, For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in this covenant. Mercy is not just for those who keep the covenant. God gave these people mercy who didn't keep the covenant, who didn't, uh, didn't, uh, were not innocent, and they were not ignorant. They were deliberately disobedient. He still gave them mercy. Mercy's not just for those who fit our scope of thinking they deserve it. That's the point. These people are demonstrated by these few verses that they did not deserve mercy. They deserved judgment. But that's what makes mercy, mercy. So please get this right. Mercy is not simply having good feelings about others because they look like they're starting to move in the right direction. Mercy is dealing with them in the height of their belligerence and ignorance in such a way that we can prayerfully plant seeds and water seeds and see the mercy of God be brought into their life. Mercy is first an inward choice that you make. It really has nothing to do with contemporary events. It has to do with what's going on inside of you. Verse 38 says this, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity. Compassion is an inward trait. The outworking of compassion is mercy. Compassion in us produces mercy from us. And and, and notice that, here's where it started, that God was full of compassion. That we have to understand that if we're going to be merciful as, as God is and commanded us to be, that it begins inside of us. So we're not looking at these people saying, man, and, and I heard some of this when we went down to Seattle that day, but man, uh, it's, you can go if you want to, but um, I ain't going to a place like that. It's not worth my time. That's what I heard. How many of you would like to, I, I know we'll never, we'll never be able to count it, but I can almost guarantee you something. We did not win anybody to the Lord that day. We did plant a lot of seeds. To be quite frank, we did get a headache. I did anyway, a few times. Um, But do you think that the guys who said, it's not worth my time, won any more people to the Lord that day than we did? Almost guarantee you not. Because if they were zealous about that, they would have been desirous of being a conduit of his mercy there, in my opinion. I'm not sitting back throwing anything at them. They're my friends still. I'm just telling you that that mercy begins inside of us. And it's when we have compassion. What's compassion? Someone tell me. There's plenty of women in here. That should be tenderness. I think that's an attribute of compassion. Active care, I think that's a product. Yep. I think it's when we are walking in their shoes, if you will. Like empathy. Mm-hmm. Empathy and compassion, I think, are in- inseparable. I think they, they're the mush of the word, if I can say it. It's a desire to help. It is. Based upon the empathy, the idea of walking around their shoes. And so we, then mercy acts, doesn't it? Compassion acts in mercy. Okay? When we have the desire and the empathy and all of these things, that's compassion, but that's in us. And it acts out of us in mercy. So understand that, compa- that mercy is something that is a choice we make in us. How do you become compassionate? Think of others. I sometimes, I agree, that's a great thought. I sometimes think of others and it's not compassionate. 
I mean, I'm getting ready to drive 2,200 miles one way because some people couldn't do their job right. We see them through the eyes of God, of Christ, the same way he saw us. Do you know what I was before he saved me? I was everything the people in the Chaz zone were. No, not, 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 not literally, but it could just as easily have been me there as, and them here. Because someone saw me as through the eyes of Christ. And they had compassion. They wanted to help me do something different. They cared about what happened. They had empathy. They knew that I would spend eternity separated from God without help. And they acted in mercy. Right? Compassion begins with a choice, doesn't it? Really drawing nigh to God in our life. But it's a decision we make. Instead of looking at other people as inconvenient, icky, and how can they be so stupid, but beginning to see them with the brokenness that God sees them with. It was Jesus who wept over a rebellious city of Jerusalem, standing up on the uh, lower third of the Mount of Olives, looking over it and saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only would have turned around, I would have saved you, I would have covered you, I would have redeemed you. They didn't. But he didn't look at them and say, You bunch of... He was broken and had compassion. So it's a decision that we make. It's a mercy begins in us with a decision. Just quickly, just one more thing for you tonight. Mercy is, is focused on their need, not your passions or convenience. Verse 39 says this. For he remembered that they were but flesh, their need. A wind that passeth away, their need, and cometh not again. What is he saying? Their mortal flesh and their life goes like this. And when it's over, it's over. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and passeth away. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. What he understood was their need. It wasn't about his convenience or about the things that he thought were really cool or about getting in the way of his agenda. Mercy is focused upon the need of those to whom we begin to act in mercy, recognizing the true nature of them. Can I help you with this? Please stop being angry at sinners when they act like sinners. Please. I don't even think they would be as angry as us if we acted like Christians more. I say us. But for goodness sakes, when we're going to sit around and talk bad and, and stay away from and leave to the, to the results of their own living, these people that are in desperate need of mercy because their nature is the nature of a lost person, that says we're not people of mercy. We're called to be people of mercy. Don't imagine that somehow your judgment is more keen than God's. Here's how keen God's judgment was towards them. That he died for all, right? So that all might live. That on the cross of Calvary, he became sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God didn't look at some and say, Pah. he looked at all and said, all, uh, I want them. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Don't think somehow your judgment is more keen than God's. And that you by walking through life can pick out those who are not deserving of mercy, because the truth is mercy has never been deserved ever. It is a charge given into our life that we're to make a choice of inwardly and live outwardly. By giving opportunity to those in desperate need of mercy to find the mercy of God through the life we live and the words we declare. We're called to be people of mercy. We understand what it is. We have one thing to think about tonight. Am I a person of mercy? Well, I think I am, preacher. I keep rabbits. I adopt dead cats. I... Um, I don't know, I, 
I uh, put a little money. Ah, don't do that. I put a little money in the cup of the guy at the corner. You know, I give him. A, I mean, I usually give him like a quarter or two, and or even ten dollars. I'm pretty merciful. That's nice, I suppose. It's not necessarily mercy. How do we say to them, be warmed and fed? And not say to them, there's a Savior. Man came to check our fire extinguishers yesterday. Ask him how he was doing. He said, well, honestly, I'm having a pretty rough time. I said, really, how come? He said, well, my best friend just passed away. I had to go to his funeral yesterday. And I said, oh, that's too bad. He goes, yeah, it's got me thinking that it's probably what we're all going to face. I said, you know, I believe you're right. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says your life's just a vapor, then vanisheth away. And you yourself, Dave, his name is Dave, you yourself one day are going to draw your last breath and you have no idea when. The difference is not whether you're going to die or not, because you are. But are you ready? He said, I'm not ready. I said, I'd love to help you with that. At the end of it, he didn't get saved yesterday, but I'm praying he will. And I had the opportunity to talk to him and plant the seed and give him a track. And I was wishing we had some done books. Um, tracks are nice, but there are things that are needed more sometimes. We didn't have any. We're going to order some more. You know what that man needed when he came here? Access to mercy. Did he find salvation? Maybe when he left, I don't know. Not while we were together. But I'm going to tell you that it would not be very merciful of me to go like, well, that's a bummer, man. We'll just all pray for you. And send him on his way wondering if tomorrow is his time. What happens? Not mercy. We're called to be people of mercy. Are we? Are we? Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your mercy and goodness to us. Help us, Lord, to be honest about the character trait of mercy in our life. And Lord, to do something about it. To choose compassion and walk in mercy. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.